I'm not going to get into that right now, just like that. I will just say that it's a really privilege that we have with us, uh, that we have with us, uh, such a distinguished personality. We couldn't have asked for more, you know, someone who was a PhD from uh, Stanford and taught at MIT and continues to teach at some of these distinguished uh, educational institutions such as Stanford and others. Okay. So, all of you should feel that you are all lucky to be listening to Adhrani and Sarkar. Uh, and that too, and such a very interesting and emerging topic that is industry of internet. All of you have some idea of what the internet or what it has done. So, the next phase of the internet that is the industry of internet. So, those of you who are there at the information probably have had sampled the, you know, the good lecture that he gave, the very well, excellent lecture, I should say, that he gave at uh, information. So, thank you so much and then welcome to my show, welcome to ISIL. So this 
information there, the, the issue, the struggle that we have, for example, in the state of Karnataka is that one issue is that we do not have enough power. The other issue that we have is uh, the, the power is not balanced. So the time is so smart meter would be something that's similarly in your home and it allows you to control where the electricity is going and how much of it is made, and made available in which form. Uh, it would allow you to control your billing suitably. So for example, utility could say, everyone comes home from office at around 6.30, 7.30, all televisions swing on, all cooking devices swing on. Suddenly power consumption becomes as high as possible. You can use power then, but I'm going to make it more expensive for you incentivize you to spend less power then. You may think that's unfair, but it's simple economics. It's simple supply, demand, and pricing. So the capacity still exists to do that. We can do it now. And in some countries, they do. In countries like, for example, Iceland, Scandinavia, where power is, is not easy to come by, they operate their entire power ecosystem that way. For, for power savings, yes. But the question is to make that work, it has to have the data coming from the other end. So I can incentivize you to do something, but I also need a way of tracking how that incentive is, so to speak, going. So I can incentivize you to build a house with a solar panel on it, but if I don't know how much solar power is being consumed, you know, there's very little likely to be on just paying your limit. So taking advantage of the data is the next step of those incentives. So all this leads to certain business benefits, business advantages. And because these business advantages are showing up and making a real difference, that's where the investment is coming from. So the investment in the industrial internet is coming because of those benefits on the right. Why was the investment made in the, shall we say, the people internet? Defense. I mean, to start with. To start with. So somebody said, I need a free network so that I can communicate freely. And others piggyback on it. And they said, it doesn't cost me any more. So if a number of defense units are communicating and you and I use the same road, so to speak. In economics, there's a difference between a private good and a public good. Communication bandwidth became a, a, a public good. Now it isn't. Now therefore we're going into spectrum auctions and all kinds of things around it. And to do that, we need people need to raise revenue and then it's an advertising model roughly. I used to I still go to cricket food or track tickets course. And slowly I'm getting disappointed by it because there are more and more ads showing up. And it's becoming a, a less, you know, nice thing. Early on, we came from what was set up by people I worked with in study, but it was more a toy thing. But it was wonderfully user-friendly. Uh, monitoring and diagnostic services, the kinds of services that I was talking about in the last slide. Now we have lots and lots of systems, thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe medical systems, power generation, aircraft engines, industrial systems, locomotives, newer sectors like water and oil and gas, which are hard. As I was saying, they're more chemical based often. So you need new science often, new sensor technologies to figure that out. Uh, sensors are initially digital. I'm sorry, initially they're analog, which means that you know that, that they're working and they're not. Uh, uh, you have an AC here. The simpler sensor for what's happening to the AC is a piece of paper stuck to it. And we often see that. So if it's fluttering, that AC is working. If it's not, that AC is not working. That's a simple analog sensor. And then but it, it's hard to transmit that data. You can take a picture of it. Not very interesting and in a, in a very circuitous way of doing it. Or you can digitize it in some way. So you want to think about what would a digital piece of cartridge paper be. But, so it's a little hard in some industries, but we're getting there. It's what humans do. We all do condition-based maintenance. What is a human's version of condition-based maintenance? When I'm sick, when you're sick, you go, interesting, yes, so, so temperature, so we all do it, do we do it well? Do we monitor blood pressure? Should we monitor blood pressure? Should it be based on our condition in some way? <coughs> I mean, the theory being you go to McDonald's and, and pick out and then you should measure your blood, blood pressure just after that. You could, that would think well of, you know, some kind of condition. Something is not particularly going well based on it monitor more uh, based on it, take different types of actions. So here the monitoring is not uh, in some way completely passive, it's inactive and based on it the maintenance also becomes a little more active. A power plant is running uh, base load. So a base load power plant is what? It's always running. So in this center for the new university you probably have some power systems that are essentially base load. 
So let's suppose that you're running some kind of high performance computer server that typically would be in a base load machine with a UPS attached to it, etc. Some of it would be much more cyclic. So the power demand when it peaks, it's available. When it's not, it goes down. And that's generally, generally so. So based on that, you would have different kinds of maintenance protocols associated with it. You wouldn't take off a base load machine very easily. Aircraft carriers are designed often for 50 year life. These are large ships. And they're designed in such a way so that when they're made, they go out to sea. 25 years later, they're supposed to come back once, spend two years in dock, and then go out again and spend 25 years. In theory. So 25 years or 20 years, let's say, they're not supposed to come back. So this entire maintenance is done by parts flying around based on the condition of the machine. Parts like forecasting, what do I need? There, there are trains, wheels on the bottom of that train. Can I move them around? Uh, those of you who get, uh, get your uh, car serviced, your, you get something called wheel balancing done. Generally, it appears like a ripoff. Why do I want wheel balancing done? I thought this was free servicing. What's wrong with my wheels? Uh, so, one part of wheel balancing is in that, that kind of Rotating device is one way of dealing with wheels. Think of a locomotive, so when a train, so trains often do the same journey over and over again. So what happens if the train does the same journey, and let's suppose that it's turning on a track this way. What's going to happen to its wheels? This side is going to see more weight. So as this side sees more weight, more is going to wear out. So what will you, what do, what will you want to do soon? You want to change it. Now an easy change is you just switch these two. So you don't need new wheels. You don't even need a new yard or anything. You just go in, you take the wheels and put this side, you come over. And then you run it for a little more time. Because if you think that it's going to go in the same direction, yes, ma'am. Okay, you just said at the turning you change the wheels, right? Yes. No, not at the turning, not while it's turning. Because it pays off. Yes. The wireless idea is to extend it. Wheels the next journey yes. uh, when it pays off. Yeah. So what about when it is having a straight journey? Again, wheels are not balanced. Yes. Yeah, so this so this depends. On, so that's an interesting question. It depends on condition-based maintenance of hardware forecasting. That is what is called mission dependent. So in other words, we're assuming that the locomotive is doing the same mission. In the guard section. Also. Yes. So or it's, or it's turning the same way. So it's embanking or it's going over the same bridge. It's going to do the same thing over and over again. If it's doing the same thing over and over again, my forecasting parts becomes easier. So if you were, for example, wanting to figure out what do you have for lunch, and you know that for the next, uh, say, two years, you're going to be here, you have a rough idea what you're going to have for lunch every day. By the end of your program, you're going to ask, what am I going to have lunch for the next two years? You don't quite know, because you know that your mission is going to change. So for a transportation device whose mission is changing, this looks different. But if an aircraft is flying from, say, uh, North Africa to South Africa, it's flying over the Sahara, over the equator, it sees a certain temperature profile. If it's going over the Arctic, it sees an entirely different pro profile. If I have a fleet in which these planes are switched, then I have an issue. Companies don't like that usually. How many of you have flown, uh, let's say, Indigo? Right? For those of you who have flown Indigo, can you tell which kind of plane you're flying? Or do they all look the same? So most airlines like having planes that look very similar. So the same mission profile applies in some way to all of them. And, I look at, and the same kind of condition based maintenance. How does that help? That helps because now my parts life is management is a lot easier. So if a plane that comes into Calcutta and wants to say, I, 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 I want to get myself fixed, it doesn't matter what that plane was doing. It's pretty much doing the same thing that every other plane was doing. But if all the planes were different, then they, they need to work that way. Life may change for them a little bit. They now have international flights, so they'll use bigger planes, which means they'll need to do their past air management better. But so then the day outs I kept talking about one interesting word, the warranty cost containment, uh, which means managing insurance. So insurance is an interesting thing. How do you make money on insurance? This question is for both supplier and consumer. So in other words, when is insurance viable? Why would you buy insurance? Say for insurance for your car or health insurance, why would you buy it? 
Okay. Why would I sell it to you? That's your benefit. What's my benefit? Because not everyone is going to buy it, you know, at the same time. So a lot of large numbers kind of kind of situation. So I have to pay some people, but there's a whole bunch of people I don't want to pay. So probability will be uh, the profit ratio. Probability of people. The probability of people. That's the same argument. So here's my question to you. Suppose um, I know that the equipment has improved or I have an industry internet and I have more information on the data and I can take better care of it. What should happen to the price of insurance? Increase should be less. Less. No, less. Less. Should come down. It, it should come down provided, <laughs> and this asymmetric information, provided you know that is the case. Let's suppose you don't know that. Then what happens? So I now know that your car actually can run longer. You don't know that. If you knew that, you would then now negotiate for a lower cost of insurance. What about the other way around? What about if you knew that the car was running better or worse, but I didn't? You would be then be willing to pay a higher cost of insurance and you would then say, oh, these guys don't really know that more is wrong, which is, which is what happens in medical insurance. You know what's wrong with you and you go looking for insurance. You know the highest stress factors in, 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 your, um, in your life or you're seeing what, what's happening to your parents and you know the risks you are about to face. So you now know more. So now with this kind of information available to everyone, the whole dynamics around warranties and warranty costs now changes. And we don't know how that's going to play out. Slowly we're moving towards what are called long-term service agreements, not really warranties. So a long-term service agreement in healthcare would look like that. It wouldn't really look like insurance. It would look like an agreement that you have with say a hospital that says that I'm going to pay the hospital a certain amount, almost like a membership fee to a club. But if something goes wrong with me, you will take care of it. For vehicles, that model is already partly there. GM, etc. Many shops offer that kind of service. Not so much in India, perhaps. Yes. But for many products, that kind of model exists. Like for example, vehicles, you know, they can also see the last three years are not Yes. So they should, I mean, that's what they, I have with my. Correct, correct, correct. So I haven't had an accident first of all. You should get a rebate. Yes, yes. and you should get a rebate. They don't have that one set. So they can have it. Correct. Right now, insurance prices come down. You, some organizations offer a little bit of no accident uh, bonuses, but usually your insurance premiums come down because your car is getting older. So to fix the car, they say, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you, I need to spend less money. I won't give you a new car. That incentive is there wrong. Then you'll deliberately crash your car and get a completely new, new car. So the price of insurance then goes down. But the long-term service agreement idea is that I'm not guaranteeing your product, I'm guaranteeing your service. And that's the agreement that you and I are going to make. Very difficult things to play with, contracts and service agreements, etc. If you thought option pricing was hard, this is a nightmare. Pricing things of this sort. And the probabilities and the risks are, are, are much more convoluted than they are now. And it's probably going to be a very active research area. In some way, these more advanced contract pricing scenarios. Current economic theory and current, current finance theory is nowhere equipped to deal with what's actually being designed um, and new regulations coming. Okay, I'll speed up a little bit more. Mm, the data flows associated with such a thing, uh, I talked about it a lot. Uh, the data collection analysis, sensor and control data from the equipment, event logs, error and event logs. This is interesting, error and event logs. How do you log an event? Something goes wrong with the machine, how do you log it? What does the log say? The census is data, then? Connectivity. A typical way of logging an event is writing about it. Just writing it down. Some service engineer said, this is what happened to the machine. What that therefore means is that in the future, so there is an event log. As soon as you go into event log and you want to convert that into data, this takes you into realms where text mining. Because now the information that's available is information about the equipment, but it's information in a different kind of data form. 
Other data formats also exist, for example, inspection images. Something goes to inspection and you're looking at images. So the combination of stuff that's available to me is a combination of data, images, pictures of the thing, text, which is people talking about the thing, and various kinds of complaints. How do you figure out which restaurant is good? These days, the right thing to do, apparently, my wife does this a lot, go to the website, look for reviews. Let's figure out that's good. So that's text mining. So essentially, she's doing some kind of forecasting or some kind of, you know, uh, shall we say, service information extraction based on text for services that the organization is providing. So text is different in different forms. Uh, data, therefore, is different. Data logistics, communicating that, uh, connectivity, bandwidth, cost transmissions, uh, who pays for it. Right now, the internet is roughly free, but slowly, it's the, the, the different business models are emerging. So who pays for it? Would you pay for it? Would someone else pay for it? Uh, would that be provided? If you are, and I absolutely hope this doesn't happen to you, if you're a heart patient and your pacemaker is connected remotely,